morning, everyone, and welcome back to day two of uh, the 25th annual Atlanta Fed Financial Markets Conference. Uh, we are uh, very pleased today to be able to offer as our first event, the keynote uh, fireside chat uh, with Dr. Larry Summers. There is uh, an extended um, bio uh, on the links uh, on the website uh, to the conference. Uh, but if you uh, are not uh, familiar with who Larry Summers is and his biography, then you may have wandered into the wrong uh, webcast. Uh, but stick around uh, if uh, you're in for a treat. Um, suffice it to say that uh, Dr. Summers uh, has been one of the most influential and powerful uh, voices on the world stage for decades uh, now um, and has occupied the highest offices in both academia uh, and government uh, and is uh, one of the most respected voices on policy uh, in, in the world, uh, let alone the country. Um, so uh, with that, um, welcome Professor Summers. Uh, it's good to have you. Glad to be with you, but glad to be back at the Atlanta uh, Fed uh, conference. Sorry, I won't be able to play golf with some of the participants uh, this year because we're all virtual, but look forward to that occasion in the future. Great. Um, so let's jump right in. Uh, yesterday's uh, uh, sessions had um, an international flavor to them in large part. Uh, Vice Chair Clarida started off uh, discussing uh, the uh, interconnection of uh, financial markets across the globe, uh, bond markets in particular, uh, and uh, noted that um, the synchronicity, if you will, of, um, of bond yields and prices not entirely accounted for by um, a correlation in economic conditions. Uh, later on in the day in our panel, in the day in our panel, um, uh, Willem Bowder uh, suggested that um, maybe in the United States, policymakers don't pay sufficient attention to uh, those impacts that might exist on the rest of the world. So let, let, let me start off by asking you sort of what's your assessment of uh, the state of uh, financial market stability in the world and how you think about um, the responsibilities and connection uh, of U.S. policymakers uh, to maintaining and fostering stability. I've always believed that the objective of U.S. policy should be to promote the welfare of American citizens, that uh, American citizens benefit from a strong economy along with uh, price stability, along with uh, being having substantial uh, purchasing uh, power, which is why I always supported as Treasury Secretary a uh, strong dollar. I believe that those objectives can best be pursued uh, by taking a cooperative uh, posture, that working to contain financial crises in other countries uh, serves to promote general financial stability, which benefits American citizens. That's why I, in government and out, have urged strong and aggressive responses to various emerging markets financial crises. I've believed, as I said on many occasions, that the American global economy cannot fly on a single American uh, engine, and therefore have thought that the United States has a very strong interest in the success of the global economy, because the global economy is, after all, a major market for the 12 odd percent of our economy that represents uh, exports. But it seems to me that American policy needs to be anchored in um, American uh, interests, if it is to be uh, politically sustainable. I have felt though, as I say, that that requires uh, global cooperation. I was very proud to have the chance to work with uh, Paul Martin um, during the time I was treasury secretary uh, 
to establish the G20 as a financial uh, group because I felt very strongly that uh, the G7 could no longer be the dominant group shaping directions for international financial policy uh, in an economy that was uh, rapidly uh, changing. So do you, is it your view that by and uh, large, there is a, a correspondence between the sorts of actions that have to be taken in uh, the event of disruptions uh, in financial markets offshore? Um, or are there instances, I mean, you have, you have a lot of experience in this. There are instances where sometimes there are really significant trade-offs uh, that we face. And, and what would those trade-offs look like? That's right. I understand precisely the terms of the question. Certainly, the United States has a legitimate interest in resisting um, financial exchange rate manipulation by other countries. I think that while one can question the way in which the discretion has been used, the ability of the Treasury Department to single out um, exchange rate manipulators has, I think, been a useful thing both in the context of particular instances of manipulation and probably even more as a deterrent to exchange rate manipulation for uh, commercial advantage. I think in general, there is much more risk in the present context that the United States will do too little on the global front than that it will do uh, too much. So I think that President Biden's step to make available 20 million vaccines was an important and valuable step, but I think the United States has been substantially insufficient in its support for a strong global response to COVID, which in light of the fact that the main dangers from COVID right now come from evolution, and evolution of the virus is as likely in Lagos as in Los Angeles, I think we have a great stake in an aggressive global response uh, to containing uh, the uh, to, cont to containing uh, the virus. I think we have a great stake in assuring what's not now in place, which is a satisfactory architecture for dealing with debt problems if and when uh, they come. And I think there's a good chance that we will see very substantial um, pressures on emerging market debts sometime in the next few years. So let me kind of uh, push on both of those um, comments. Um, with respect to COVID, um, obviously there was, um, you know, fits and starts in our own dealing uh, with COVID in the country. What would a more aggressive and appropriate uh, international uh, policy have looked like? It would have involved uh, vastly greater funding for uh, COVAX, for ACTA, for the various efforts to support developing countries through this and to make vaccination pervasively available. It would, as I warned years ago, have involved very substantially greater budgets for pandemic preparation than uh, the world engaged in. I am concerned today that we're gonna focus an enormous effort on putting COVID in the rear view mirror and that we're not gonna make a sufficient effort to be ready for the next uh, pandemic. Looking at the record of COVID, MERS, Ebola, and uh, N1, H1, H1 uh, the flu and other SARS and other diseases, I think it's a reasonable judgment that we're going to face a COVID-like threat at least once a decade going forward. And that means the world needs to be in a very different place than it is right now with respect to the availability of uh, resources uh, to provide for testing, to provide for masking, to provide for vaccine production. I think it's very difficult in times of emergency to adequately be thinking about the next emergency, 
And yet, I think that is absolutely uh, essential right now. I would say the central banking uh, community has to date been roughly 50 to 100 times more focused on issues of climate finance than on issues of pandemic uh, finance and of readiness to uh, deal with the next pandemic when it comes. And I think that's been an error on the part of the uh, central banking community. And I hope that the central banking community will think about what it can do to make sure that there is adequate finance available for more rapid and more decisive uh, responses the next time the world faces a pandemic threat. So is it your, is it your uh, position that the climate focus is an inappropriate um, place for a central bank to put its uh, energies or it's just a matter of priorities and, and what are the bigger threats? I think that central banks should be focused on making sure that uh, financial stability is maintained and using the tools at their disposal uh, of financial policy to assure that economies are able to uh, function well. I, it's been my view that as grave a problem as, uh, glo as global climate change uh, is, I have not seen stranded assets associated with climate change policies that are not appreciated by the market as being a terribly important source of systemic financial risk. I think they are dwarfed by a whole set of issues in uh, the shadow banking system, for example. And I think central banks have, in order to be relevant to something that's on political leaders and citizenry's mind, have rather stretched things in the degree of emphasis they place on those kinds of stranded assets uh, issues. On the other hand, I think that uh, assuring that credit is readily available to get masks to people, to get, uh, to enable relief payments uh, to uh, be made, I think that is a more pressing issue of systemic stability and one that central banks, perhaps over time, uh, need to uh, be more focused on. And I certainly would welcome uh, greater initiative in Basel or in other central banking forums around uh, the risks associated with, uh, pand uh, associated with pandemic. There's always a question as to how broadly versus narrowly focused you want central banks to be, and I can appreciate a variety of perspectives on that question. What I'm more confident of is that they have reached much further beyond their traditional mandates with respect to the climate change issue than they have with respect to the pandemic issue, and that the payoff at the margin to more focus on pandemic is likely to be greater. Thanks. I do want to remind everyone that you can use pigeonhole to submit uh, any questions you would uh, you would like considered. Um, I want to get back to that. I want to get to that shadow banking comment in a second. But uh, before I do, you also uh, mentioned that one of the uh, areas of insufficient focus, uh, forward looking focus, is uh, emerging market debt. Um, how do you think we ought to be positioning? Uh, ourselves, either through fiscal policy or through monetary policy, uh, in in light of that concern. <laughs> Some of it's about monetary uh, and fiscal policy, and I think that we have underestimated the risks very substantially, both to financial stability and uh, to uh, as well as to conventional inflation of uh, protracted, extremely low uh, interest rates, even in economies that are performing strongly as the US economy 
uh, is uh, right now. But I think with respect to emerging market debts, the principal issue is that we have substantial amounts of debt that if you look at the size of the credit spread, you have to think there's a meaningful chance that that debt is, need, is going to need to be rescheduled or restructured. And we have a set of institutions that are well suited to traditional creditors but are, and traditional borrowers, but are not well suited to a world like the present in which there is very substantial uh, lending by, uh, b- through bonds to private sector entities in emerging market uh, countries and in which there's very substantial lending by Chinese institutions that are not party to the Paris Club and not party to other standard institutional arrangements. There's an understandable reluctance to plan excessively for default, just like there's an ex- a reluctance to plan excessively for paying ransom in the event of kidnapping. You don't want to plan for failure. That will make failure more likely. On the other hand, I think we are left with an architecture that is really quite uh, suspect. I, along with uh, Guillermo Ortiz, Jean-Claude uh, Trichet, uh, and others uh, have put out a report under the auspices of the G30 that looks in more detail um, at uh, these issues. A substantial part of it involves the uh, establishment of appropriate institutional architectures that would prevent a variety of problematic debt practices that will make restructurings that are likely to be necessary very, very difficult if that need arises in the future. So we got a question in uh, that's uh, related to this um, and um, kind of paraphrase it. I mean, the direct question is, are you concerned about a tightening phase in the US is going to serve as a sort of tipping point for these problems? Uh, And I guess a related notion would be, um, is there time in your view to position ourselves to avoid any serious sorts of of, uh, disruption associated with um, pursuing what may be viewed as appropriate monetary policy in the US? I believe that the serenity that is being projected with respect to inflation, the policy projections suggesting that rates may not be raised for three years, close to three years, are creating a dangerous complacency that make it more likely that when, as I think is quite likely, there is a strong need to adjust policy, those adjustments will come as a surprise and jolt to market participants in ways that will do real damage to uh, financial stability and may do real damage uh, to uh, the economy. So I believe the idea that the balance of risks is anything like equal between deflation and inflation, between financial bubbles and uh, credit uh, problems, between acceleration and slowdown. I believe the reading that suggests that we are near equipoise is very far off of an accurate reading of the US economy uh, right now, and that to the extent that it is widely internalized, as I think it has been by market participants, we are setting the stage for, and indeed uh, partway through a vicious cycle in which rising inflation coupled with constant nominal rates leads to decreasing real rates, which leads to expansionary pressure, which leads to more inflation, which leads to lower real rates, and so forth. And so I think we are underappreciating the extent to which uh, 
we have put a very substantial pro-cyclical bias into uh, financial conditions by anchoring uh, nominal rates. So uh, how do we get off of the stage that we are setting? I think we need and needs to be done with care and uh, gradualism, but it needs to be done clearly to signal that we are in a very different place in our assessment of the economy than we were six months ago. That the pr primary risks today involve overheating, asset price uh, inflation, and subsequent financial excessive leverage and subsequent financial instability. Not um, a downturn in the economy, excessive, un excessive uh, unemployment and excessive sluggishness. And the rhetoric regarding future policy needs to adjust in a substantial way. It is not tenable to assert today that in the contemporary American economy, labor market slack is a dominant problem. Walk outside. Labor shortage is the pervasive uh, phenomenon. And the failure to recognize that and the failure to begin an adjustment uh, to that reality puts at risk the kinds of uh, mistakes that we have not seen made in the United States for a long time. The new Fed framework put in place in Jackson Hole last year was a reasonable response to secular stagnation coupled with COVID. It is not a reasonable place for policy to be in a world where the budget deficit has been expanded by 15% of GDP by stimulative policy, in my view. So does that, um, so you reference specifically uh, the uh, employment part of the mandate and framework, I presume, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't presume, you feel the same about the average inflation targeting uh, mechanism and the implicit sort of backward look uh, rather than forward look. Uh, I, 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 think, I, I think that I, I believe the old fashioned way, um, we strive for price stability and we'll know price stability when we see it is the appropriate way to address that part of the Fed's mandate. I believe the focus on a numerical target was, has never been a helpful contribution uh, to policy. I never saw why obsessing about 1.7 versus two was valuable, nor do I see the virtue of obsessing about 2.3 uh, versus, uh, versus two. I think the operative challenge is to recognize what are the primary risks in any given uh, situation. And we adopted a framework that was appropriate to uh, a world where the primary risk was sluggishness. The primary risk was credit problems. The primary risk was deflation. And we signaled in a broad way that we were seeing those things as the primary risks and we're prepared to take other chances in order to avoid those risks. That was an appropriate general direction uh, to set. Um, it should have been set with my view, as I said at the time, with more awareness that the world changes and more awareness that you can't know where things are going to uh, be. And so in a less detailed and prescriptive uh, way, 
but the general orientation of it was correct. But no one could have imagined that when that framework was set, that eight months later, we would have 15% of GDP in additional stimulus committed with another um, $4 trillion um, ahead in, headed, headed forward in stimulus. No one could have imagined that the vacancy rate, the job openings rate would be approaching record levels. No one could have imagined that survey expectations um, would be on fire, um, both for future sales and for future inflation to the extent uh, that uh, they are. And in that context, um, we need to recognize that we're in a very different place than we imagined we would be, rather than pledging fealty uh, to the judgments we made in an entirely different uh, context. And I think there's both a lesson about now in this, and there's a broader lesson about um, the dangers of trying to commit future policy for advantage today and the dangers of relying on forward guidance or descriptions of reaction functions in a world where uh, what Don Rumsfeld called unknown unknowns are uh, pervasive. So I think that both domestically and uh, globally, uh, we need to adjust ourselves for what Mervyn King has written about um, a world of radical, uh, a world of radical uncertainty. And that includes um, being willing to adjust uh, in uh, the face of uh, developments. So just to knock off a question that came in, there was a conversation yesterday about uh, whether a target should be 2% or 4%. I gather you think we ought to not be focusing on that question at all. I don't think that, I certainly would not support a 4% target. I think a 4% target will become a 6% uh, uh, target. I think that 2% can be understood as uh, reflecting uh, price stability. But I think the efforts to have numerical targets um, are, it's far from clear to me that, that the benefits uh, exceed the cost. Look, the, it's very, in the Fed community, we focus very intensely on specific, on certain price indices. And for the people who attend a session like this, the distinction between the PCE and the CPI is a salient and meaningful one. And both those indices have the property that housing is acting as a drag and an anchor on measured inflation. Well, out there in America, where for the first time in American history that we can measure, a majority of houses are selling for more than their asking prices. Out there in America, where house prices by some measures are up 18% in the last 15 uh, months, they think we've got a major phenomenon of house price inflation. And that bears on the question of price stability, whatever, however, some owner equivalent rent measure is calculated within uh, the CPI. So I think we've got to bring rather back uh, the exercise of uh, judgment uh, rather than mechanical modeling uh, in uh, the treatment of inflation. So we got a question in that sort of is pushing back about your judgment on the labor market. Uh, so I'll read it directly. The payroll employment in May was 
still more than 8 million uh, below where it stood before the pandemic? And how are you squaring that with your observation that labor market is uh, tight everywhere you look? My judgment that the labor market is tight everywhere I look comes from everywhere, everywhere I look, there are vacancies, people eager to fill the vacancies and unable to fill the vacancies without very rapid wage increases. And they, even with very rapid wage increases having started, the vacancies remain. Why is that happening at a time when uh, employment is still lower than uh, previous peaks? I think the logic of uh, supply and demand tells you that when you have price up and quantity down, that you've had a supply shock. So looking at that data, you would be inclined to think there was a supply shock. And then if the government is paying um, large numbers of people more to not work than they're able to earn by working, it would stand to reason that that would create a supply shock. And if there were substantial fears and inhibitions coming from COVID around the fact that people are not able uh, to uh, work, that would also create a supply shock. So I find there to be a reasonably consistent interpretation of the data that there's been an adverse supply shock to labor at the same time that there's been a very substantial demand shock, that those two things together uh, point towards increased uh, prices and uh, not such great quantities. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And the appropriate monetary res policy response to that is surely not to push your foot even harder down the accelerator. Let me repeat, constant nominal rates in an environment of increasing inflation expectations represent a kind of policy easing. Now, I think the important debate is maybe this supply shock is all going to solve itself when unemployment insurance benefits revert to normal and when kids go back to school in September. And that's certainly uh, possible, and certainly that's what I hope we see. Um, it's odd for the people who are most enthusiastic about expansionary policy to be most committed to the belief that unemployment insurance isn't having any effect on labor supply. And so I'm surprised every time I hear my friends in the administration assert that unemployment insurance is having no effect, since I would have thought the best argument for their kind of fiscal stimulus was to suggest that we're going to get a big surge in labor supply in September. I've been, I'm very impressed by the work that just came out um, from uh, Melissa Kearney and Jason uh, Furman. It basically shows that the labor supply for adults with young children has not gone down more than the labor supply for adults without young children. And so the idea that we can think of this supply shock as somehow related to schools and all of that and childcare responsibility is just not in the data. And so it's just not right. Now it may be that as everybody feels like they can take their mask off large numbers of people are going to go back to work. And I think there will be some of that. But I don't, it would surprise me um, as the stimulus checks are spent over the next months, as the overhang of $2 trillion of savings is worked off, as everyone goes back to the stores and onto airplanes and starts to take trips, if that's a world where the number of job openings goes down, could happen, but that would not be what I would expect without some significant upwards pressure on wages. 
So let, let me let me flip this this part this conversation sort of to the financial uh, price side of things. Um, you're kind of drawing a picture of of uh, supply and demand imbalances that are not in the right direction, um, or maybe they're in the right direction, depending on your point of view, on inflation uh, concerns that um, are front uh, of your mind. Why have we not seen a sharper run-up in, uh, in uh, market yields? Well, first of all, depends on how you look at these things, I guess. Um, I haven't looked at this in the last several weeks, but I think that of all the first quarters in the last century, the run-up in the 10-year yield was greater in the first quarter of 2021 than any other quarter except for 1980. So I would argue we've seen a fair-sized move in markets. Second, uh, the Federal Reserve has been doing its best to uh, suppress uh, any tendency towards uh, an increase uh, in uh, yields by remaining committed to QE policies and not even beginning a process of considering the end of uh, QE, uh, Q, uh, QE uh, policies. So to some extent, we've been suppressing uh, the uh, natural market uh, kind of uh, response. Third, uh, if you look at what I think is even more relevant, you look at what's happened to break-evens, um, as inferred from the spread between indexed bonds and um, nominal bonds, those have continued upwards and reached a peak, reached their peak for the last decade or more um, this month. So I think it's um, not right to say that markets um, have a sharply different view. I think the other part of it, frankly, is that markets are set, market prices are to some extent set globally. And policy in the United States um, has been substantially different. The kind of massive fiscal stimulus that we've had is not something that's taken place uh, elsewhere. And so I think the, the lesser inflationary tendency, lesser uh, labor shortage tendency elsewhere has been somewhat inhibiting of, uh, increase, of increases in uh, interest rates. So this time has gone lightning fast. Um, I, um, it would, I'd be hard pressed to say that your views aren't pretty clear on these things, but let me just kind of uh, 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 one more time sort of tie this up. The, the committee, Federal Open Market Committee is committed to sort of reviewing how it's thinking about things annually in its long run um, uh, strategy um, document. I'm presuming you think that they ought not wait till next January to do that and the time for reversal in policy is now. I think that I'm not, look, I've got enormous respect for uh, Jay, for your president, uh, Bostic, for, uh, uh, for Vice Chair uh, Clarida, for New York Fed President uh, Williams, or all the members of the FOMC. And I know from my time as an insider in government that people on the outside often say things that they might not say if they knew all the things and all the considerations that I had. So I'm reluctant to make tactical prescription or to criticize specific comments and uh, specific uh, actions. I would say that I think the prospects for avoiding 
turbulence um, over the next uh, year, next several years, both in the real economy and in financial markets would be substantially greater if there was a sense that uh, monetary policy authorities in the United States were focused on the need to avoid overheating rather than focused on the need to reassure people that they won't focus on overheating. And I would rather see us go back to a go back to a Fed that is concerned about preempting inflation rather than a Fed that is concerned about preempting fears that it will be concerned about inflation. And I think that points towards uh, the desirability of some change in what's being projected from the Federal Reserve System, how that integrates with uh, policy reviews, how that integrates with specific uh, meetings is uh, something that I would not presume to judge. And I would caution that I'm offering my best judgments, that I offer them in the spirit of recognizing that all policy choices are judgments under uncertainty that involve balancing uh, risks and that anyone who is certain of almost anything is uh, making a mistake and also with an awareness that from within the system, one has access to information and sees things that are hard to see from uh, the outside. And so I think outsiders like me can make a positive uh, contribution by raising uh, concerns and being a bit of a pressure point against uh, inertia, given that it's always a tendency for policymakers to want to stick with the beliefs that they've had. But equally, uh, it's important to respectfully recognize uh, that these are very difficult uh, judgments and that the Federal Reserve is sitting on top of uh, a vast body of information. Professor Summers, thank you so much. Um, you didn't disappoint um, in, uh, on any dimension there. Uh, we will now uh, take a break uh, and the program will continue at the top of the hour at 11 o'clock. Thanks everyone for joining us. <laughs>